Jesus was the most controversial figure in human history. The church has shied away from being controversial, but there are young people who have emerged in today's world who are dangerous, who are living out the radical teachings of Christ. Those words of Jesus is outlined in the red letters of the Bible. You're going to meet one of them today. You're going to be challenged today. You're going to say to yourself, am I ready to become a red letter Christian? Am I ready to become a radical? Do I want to become a dangerous person in a world where everybody's playing it safe? I hope the answer is yes. I hope you watch this show and say, I'm joining the movement. I want to be a red letter Christian. You're going to love who we're going to introduce to you today. I hope you stay through this entire program because you're about to meet one of the most controversial and interesting persons that we've ever had on this show. That's a strong statement. It is. But I haven't heard you introduce someone. Yeah. Before. Well, all of our people are kind of off the mainstream. Yes. But, uh, but controversial. Jay Baker is off the mainstream. He's written this latest book, Fall to Grace, which is an interesting Love thing. Love that title. Fall to Grace, because usually it's fall to sin. Fall, fall to from grace. Yeah, we want to talk about his new book, uh, A Revolution of God, Self and Society. I'm going to be anxious to hear what he has to say. Mm. But he started this uh, church uh, in, in New York. He, he's had a church in Atlanta. Uh -huh. My wife, Peggy, spoke in, her, in his church in Atlanta, which was held in a bar. <laughs> on a sunny morning. All these, and she said, I walked in there and I said, who are these people? You know, my wife That's is an the, interesting. I mean, she's 70 years old. Right. And she's now 72. She's a matronly dear old woman, you know. She walks into this bar, you know, Baptist background. I mean, bar. What am I doing in a bar? And here are all these people who, at first glance, are off the wall. And the more she's with them, the more she realizes how her stereotypical impressions of people mm -hmm. have kept her from real genuine relationships. Wow. And she ended up being friends with the people there. And she ended up loving Jay Baker. And uh, he's... He's one of her favorite people in the whole world. I can't wait to talk to him about that and how that got started and, and if there's all different bars he goes to. I mean, you hear people meeting on corners and cities yeah. at coffee shops, but not no, at bars. Th these, these are meetings in bars where they talk about Jesus. Oh, no, I know. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. That's, that's amazing. You know, and when I say Jay Baker, of course, the name says, gee, that, that comes to mind. The son of Jim Baker, Tammy Baker, you know, the PTL. Absolutely. Uh, we we'll want to know. Which is intriguing that he, you know, some people would think well, after all that, he would say the heck with God. Yeah, yeah. You and, know? And, and I think we ought to ask him uh, why he didn't just walk away from the church. And what was it that really disillusioned him about Christianity? Was it his parents? Was it the way in which people reacted to his parents? Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody wanted to be on a show when they could sell the book. You know, yeah. you know, I got a book. I, hey, would you buy my book? They all wanted to be on Jim Baker's show when he was, they were selling books. The minute he got into trouble, they fled. Well, you know, t uh, Tony, and, and, you know, now I'm speaking a lot, but for years I've been in CCM, Christian Music, but it was the same thing. Go to the concerts, be played on radio, you're in Christian bookstores, but get a divorce or have an affair or, you know, people step away. And well... I was speaking at a, a meeting of Presbyterian ministers right after the scandal broke, and this Presbyterian moderator was up there saying, we've got to distance ourselves from the likes of Jim Baker, lest people think that we are painted with the same brush. When I got up, I said, you are painted, painted with, with the same, the same brush. brush. And the only difference between Jim Baker and the rest of us is that they haven't found out about the rest of us yet. Yes. That's oh, the reality. Oh, so, so true. If all the secrets of our lives were flashed up on a screen, we'd be embarrassed to tears We've escaped. I can't believe you're saying that because I say if we were all filmed all week long, none of us would ever say anything about each other. Give I me often, a break. I often say when I'm preaching, if you knew all there was to know about me, you wouldn't sit there and listen to me. But if I knew all there was to know about you, I wouldn't talk to you. <laughs> we're in this together, and it's about grace, and we're going to be talking. Are you just being Italian there? Yay. <laughs> He's going to talk about grace and how grace affects his ministry. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't go away. Jay, I remember you as a 
little chubby little guy years ago when I visited your parents' PTL show. And I want to, I'm so intrigued with um, your church, but I wanted to first ask you, because I think the viewers would want to know how all that uh, scandal and what happened with your parents affected you in both the positive and negative, if you can tell us about that. Well, I mean, it was, it was, things changed in 24 hours, you know. It's strange, you know, like being on TV and studios and things like that. It's like a flashback from my childhood, you know, and then seeing in 24 hours, everything disappear. So it was, it was really dramatic. It was really hard to watch how Christians reacted. Did you sense it coming? It was a shock. Oh uh, yeah, it was a shock. Okay. I mean, it was. I mean, I knew probably a day or two before it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at that time, I thought it was going to be this whole restoration process. And then when it happened, I realized that my father just lost everything. And so yeah, it was. It was really difficult to deal with. It was difficult to see how the church reacted, um, because you know we're all, we're known as the only army that shoots its wounded. Sure. Which is sad because we're supposed to be known about forgiveness and grace and compassion. And it drove me away for a while, but... Uh, what brought you back? Grace, the idea of grace, reading... And where did that break into your life? You know, it really, not until I was probably 19 or 20, and it was coming from reading the book of Galatians. Mm -hmm. um, there was just something about God's unconditional love and grace that I saw there that I'd never seen, and then I started reading Romans, and it allowed me to see Jesus also in a different way, because, you know, Paul is the closest we have to Jesus. And that grace and that love was something that I didn't see when my parents fell and when they went through everything. And so I said, you know, I want to tell more people about this. I want to go back and say, you know, there's good news and there's a reason it's called good news and it's not because we can kick each other around or because we're better than each other or self-righteous. It's not about that stuff. It's just about living and loving. And uh, I, I was one of those persons who did not reject Jim and Tammy Baker. Yeah. Uh, I thought as I looked over their lives, that here were these two cute little kids in Muskegon, yep. uh, uh, Michigan, out doing puppet shows, leading kids to Christ. And there was a sincerity and a genuine quality about Tammy Baker that right up until the end yep. made her one of the most attractive persons on the American scene. And you couldn't look at that without realizing that there was a goodness buried deep inside that somehow got messed up, mm. destroyed. The, the glamour, the glitz, the money, yeah. the explosion of fame, all of this, I mean. Well, when you have to raise a million dollars every two days, yes. your message starts to compromise a little bit. <laughs> it, well, yeah, and, and you just, and so I can just imagine when you started this revolution church, the last thing you were gonna do was to be seduced by money and fame and wealth and whatever else. Yeah. Tell us about the Revolution Church. Well, Revolution actually started before my really even my journey to, to understanding grace. It started in, in 1994 and I'd say 95 was really my grace time. But we started originally because we saw these kids hanging outside of the church that the church really didn't seem to want in, even in their youth groups. So we just started this little ministry called Revolution where we met in an old old bar that was closed down, but we just would meet in there, and, and it was in Arizona, and, and we would just give a comfortable place for these kids to go. Over the years it grew, the message grew. We, we evolved into just being more of a regular church. We met in coffee shops, then we met in a church for a while, and uh, what happened was we needed a place to meet, and over the years, and, and, and we'd built such good relationships with the community, a bar came to us and said, we've got space, you know, come meet us. We're not doing anything on Sunday evening. You know, we'll open up for you guys. And so it was really getting to know the community that they came to us and said, we, which I felt was the biggest compliment we could have as pastors, is that people outside of the church would say, you know, we know you're safe. My wife visited your church in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And uh, she came home quite changed by the whole experience. Blown away is not a good expression. She was moved deeply. Yeah. Uh, she was moved by the fact that the bartender, when she spoke, you gave, she walked in and she thought she was just visiting and you said, well, our speaker today is. So Peggy got up and spoke and she yeah. said. <laughs> First time she didn't use notes. Yes, and uh, she didn't use oh, notes. Oh, you just kind of sprung it off. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought she was coming to speak. It <laughs> yeah. was Miss, it was but, and she, Jesus. <laughs> she did the best she could. And when she That's finished, uh, she was moved off to the side and the bartender came over and said, you know, girl, that was really good. I, 
I really got a lot of what you had to say. That was a, that kind of thing where the guy who doesn't usually hear the gospel, uh, you know, Jesus never said, build it and they will come. That's the field of dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said to us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's part of God's world. And we've okay. got to go in and we've got to make Jesus known. About how many show up on these gatherings? Uh, we've been doing anywhere from 50 to 60 lately. And, and you're up in Manhattan now. Yeah, we're actually in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And we meet a little bar. It's actually called Pete's Candy Store, but it's not a candy store. It used to be a candy store. Now it's a bar. Jay, uh -huh. tell, tell me about like a, 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 a situation or a, a person that um, stands out in your mind that came to the bar, you know, not oh. knowing anything about Jesus. And I mean, it's, it's, that's... I mean, it's almost impossible to say. I mean, we have so many people who've come because of that. There's a lot of people who are maybe ex-evangelicals or hurt Christians, or we've had people who are atheists or just no, you know, faith at all who just were sitting in the back one day and said, oh, you know, there's what's going on in here, and listen. And, and we don't really have expectations. We're not there to put, you know, notches on our belt and, and try to win everybody to Jesus. We're there to let people feel loved and accepted. So some people even are saying, you know, I'm doubting my faith. I'm losing my faith. And we say, well, you won't be alone through that. No matter which way it goes, mm. we're going to be there to love you. Because we know that that can also be a very lonely place. So there's no conventional um, gathering money and offerings. and. We have a little box in the back, and we let people know that this is how we make it. But, I mean, your life's work is, is mostly, rep you know, um, pastoring this community? That, well, I, that, I write books, and I also travel. Uh, a bit speaking around the country. He speaks at a lot of youth gatherings, as you can imagine, yeah. with his tattoos and, uh, you know, he comes on as Mr. Cool. <laughs> I mean, they look at me <laughs> and they say, what is this old guy doing here? I have here? tattoos all over my arms. Do you? No. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if you were a young person, you looked at me and you looked at Jay, uh, you would no, say, exactly. I want to listen to that guy over there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the book, uh, Fall to grace. What, what are you saying in here that we need to hear? Uh, I'm saying that the church needs to become a safer place. You know, we need to be showing grace. We need to lower the bar. Yeah. I think we as Christians were always saying, we need to hire the standard, you know, and it's like, well, we're going to make it so nobody can get in. Yeah. And it's the idea about loving people and meeting them where they're at, maybe about looking at the, the gospel in, in a different way, um, looking at your neighbor in a different way. Uh, my my wife, as you know, is uh, different than I am in her theology. Yeah. She is different. She loves Jesus more than I do. So <laughs> I, I always have to stand back and be aware of that. The theology does not define you. Yeah. It's your love for Christ and your love for other people that define you. Herein shall men know that you're my disciples. Mm. Not that you agree with me theologically, but that you love me and that you love one another. And she does that. But she, she's uh, one who has a strong relationship with the gay community. Yeah. And she has a strong liking for you because gay people can wander into the Revolution Church as it meets in this bar or wherever it meets yeah. and feel like these people do not make this an issue with me. Yeah. They receive me and love me as I am. My wife always says, uh, at, our, at your church, Tony, they always sing just as I am. You know, and you can, well, the truth of the matter is, most of the people who come can't come just as they are. Come <coughs> after you've changed. Yeah, change <laughs> yeah. first and then come. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she says, Jay's church, it, they really do mean it. They sing just as I am and they mean it. Well, we celebrate as people as God created them and as their life is. You know, I mean, that's how I met Peggy. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, we really, we're open to the gay community and we're saying, come in, we're not here to change you. We're here to love you. Yeah. We're here to celebrate your life. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, gets you in a lot of trouble, but it's, it's you know, I, I've lost a lot because of that. But you know what? It's been worth every minute. I sleep very well at night. What do you think the, the balance is, Jay, of uh, the call to, you know, when the Bible says, you know, go, go from glory to glory, glory to glory. He wants to make us more like his son. He wants us to get out of hard places, mm -hmm. bad places. Um, what, what is the fine line for you between encouraging people to change whatever it is mm -hmm. I'm not talking about one particular area and and remaining in just where they are well I've you know there's take, such a fine line. yeah I mean I kind of taken my job description out of not trying to completely change people I mean I want to disciple people but in the way of loving them you know I mean Jesus hung out with a rough crowd 
Um, I don't want to necessarily say my crowd's so rough, but I just love people where they're at. I believe that love changes people. You know, love, love does that, not me. Um, I can preach from the Bible and they can hear what I have to say, but I, 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 I try not to take the moral high ground. Or, you know, if we act like balance is a Christian idea. But there was really nothing balanced about Jesus' love and radical grace. And mm -hmm. I think if we continue to go to balance, then we're not going to be loving people radically. We're going to be loving people, well, we'll love you this way or that way. Or the whole idea of love love the sinner, hate the sin, is to me, it doesn't work. You, you know, I, have a, I have a homosexual friend who, when I laid that on him some years ago, you know, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. He barked back at me. That's just the opposite of what Jesus said. Yeah. Jesus didn't say love the sinner, hate the sin. He said, love the sinner, hate your own sin. And after you take care of your own sin, then maybe we can start talking about the sin in your brother. Yeah. I thought, oh, I felt myself put back where I ought to be uh, in a less judgmental role. We are all judgmental mm -hmm. and we've got to become less judgmental because judgment belongs in the hands of God. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I'm talking about more like I'm in a lot of women's ministry. Mm -hmm. Jay, and so you'll have the women that come up and are dealing with, you know, I have one lady, beautiful middle-aged woman came up and said, no one knows, grandmother, you know, that I'm, I'm struggling with cocaine. I'm addicted to cocaine or my daughter's, you know, wasting away anorexia. We've tried the Ramuda Ranch, we've tried so many, you know, it's that kind of thing that I have a hard time knowing, you know, what. Right. What the and well, that's why, you know, we talk about taking up our cross. I mean, growing up, my and growing up, it was always like, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls that do. That was like the hard thing. But really taking up your cross is loving people, you know, sharing another, one another's burdens. And so when you see someone who's a drug addict or things like that, you know, loving them through that, saying, hey, I want to help you get sober. Hey, yeah. I want to help you because I love you. I don't want to see your life fall apart. Um, but the really hard part is sometimes people don't change and continuing to love people through that. I mean, I have a friend who was a drug addict the whole time he was a part of my church. I just got a, I mean, I haven't seen him in five years, but I just got a letter from him the other day saying, I'm in a program, and I, I didn't know what God was gonna do. I, I don't know why God used that time, because he was never sober, but eventually he did. And he said, you know, I wanna thank you for being a part of that. But, um, you know, I was just there to maybe help water a seed that was planted or even plant a seed. I don't know. Right, sure. The fact is, is just really loving people and saying, you know, if I see you hurting yourself and doing something destructive, you know, I believe that we're punished uh, by sin, not for sin. Mm. You know, I believe it's cause and reaction. And so what I say is God doesn't want you to do this because God doesn't want to see you in pain. I don't want to see you have to self-medicate because you can't. What's the root of this problem? But letting them know that they're accepted. You are completely accepted by a power greater than yourself. And even the things that you see as unacceptable are accepted. And uh, something transformative happens there. And, uh, and if we really believe in the Holy Spirit uh, to be God and the whole, you know, that's where change happens. Mm. Uh, grace is hard for all of us to understand. Yeah. Uh, because we have this sense that we've got to do something to earn God's love. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of the prodigal son is very clear. God loves us anyway. Yeah. If you're the wayward son that runs away from home and squanders the wealth and, and lives among the whores, God, the Father is there loving you. And if you're the righteous kid who stays home and lives the upright life and is a holier-than-thou person and a pietistic Pharisee, God loves you too. There is, as it says in Romans, the eighth chapter, neither height nor depth, principalities nor powers, things present nor things to come shall be able to separate you from the love of God. Yeah, I mean, I always tell the kids, it's like we, you know, the kids, they're adults and <laughs> we're all different ages, but I always say, you know, be the father because the father is constantly saying everyone come in because he's like, well, what do we do about these religious people? All these people are pointing our fingers. I'm like, call them into the father's presence. That's yeah. what the father was continuously doing. And let's try to create a table where we can all be sitting. That's right. We can't have one group condemning another group. No. We can't have the pious Puritan condemning uh, the, the guy that boozes and uh, sleeps around. We, yeah. we got to say, come all that labor and are heavy laden, and Jesus will give you rest. I think if we can sit at the same table, we could all learn something from each other. You know, oh. you, you said something about the rough crowd that Jesus hung around with. I often do a rip on Jesus' disciples. I said, you know, have you ever heard me do that, mm -hmm. Rip? Yeah, you know, James and John, nicknamed in their hometown, Sons of Thunder. 
You can imagine what kind of guys they were. They drove around on, on camels with racing stripes and, <laughs> and had leather robes with it painted across the back. Sons of thunder. And then there were a couple of fishermen, uh, J Peter and Andrew, and they didn't even have decent nets because every time Jesus came upon them, guess what they were doing? Mending their nets. <laughs> These darn nets, what I had to... Jesus said, drop your nets and follow me. I have a feeling it was pretty easy saying, I'm glad somebody did this. Yeah, you know? And I often wonder how Mrs. Peter reacted when he came home and said, I met this guy with a beard and he said, follow me. And uh, what does he pay? Well, he doesn't pay anything. He says, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, the son of man has no place to lay his head. I can just hear Mrs. Peter saying, did you hear that, kids? Your father's after some hippie, and they're going <laughs> to be like the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. And that's what they're going to be like. Good luck, Charlie. Yeah. But uh, he did collect a strange group of people. Yeah, did he you know? know what I love? I always talk about, like, the faith of Peter, and I always say, well, you know, it's funny is that when Jesus dies, and then and raises from the, and comes back. Peter's back fishing again. Yeah. He just, you know, and they were just like, well, he's dead. I yeah. guess it's over. Yeah. You know, I mean, these guys had doubt. They didn't have faith. Yeah. They was like, well, if Jesus is dead, I better go back to work. But the fact is, is that God still used that. And it's so encouraging to see like someone like Peter who, you know, really could use a lot of help. And Peter had rejected Christ, yeah. uh, you know, at the, uh, at the fire. Yeah. Christ is being carried away. You, you're his friend. I, I never saw this guy before. I don't know where he is. Betrays Christ and the cock crows three times. I mean, three days later, he's still back, I mean, at work. Yeah, and, he didn't and, even give the t body time to rot. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> he, he, you know, he's lost it. Yeah. And I love what Jesus says uh, when he tells uh, uh the, uh, the women, go and tell the disciples. And Peter. And Peter. I mean, why did he single out? I think Peter needs an extra special yeah. word on and this. And then when he had that conversation, do you love me? It was in the yeah. morning. He was redeeming that time at the rooster yeah. when the rooster crows, you know. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, too, how is your relationship with your dad now? And does he respect what you're doing? Oh, to, do you? Totally. I mean, we talk, um, not a lot, but when we talked on the phone last time, we talked about theology for about two hours, and, but he really does respect what I do, and, and I think sometimes he wishes I could, he could say some of the things that I say, you know, because there's a lot of fear for folks. Um, I think Christian folks, especially my dad's age, who are like, well, I'm afraid if I say this or this or this, it could end everything, you know? Well, he's got a television ministry. Yeah, he has now. a television ministry He has to raise own. a lot of money. Yeah. Boy, once you bring that money into the ball game, it orders right. what you can say and what you yeah. can do. But he's doing great, you know, and that's the thing though. I had to make a decision in my own life. Do I serve? Do I want to be influential? Do I want to have, you know, finances? Do I want to do this? And I just said, no, I want to follow my convictions. Sergeant Kierkegaard has this great line. You're into Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. He said, I wish Jesus had said, you should not try to serve God and mammon instead of saying, you cannot serve God and mammon. Yeah. You either hate the one and love the other or forsake the, f the second and love the first. And that's the decision that all of us have to make. Yeah. Who are we going to serve, Jesus or mammon? Mammon being the fame, the fortune, the wealth, the, the, the ministry, how ministry can stand in the way of Jesus. Well, it hasn't stood in your way, Jay, and we're glad to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for Tattoos having me. Tattoos and all, we're glad oh. to have you. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, I don't know what to say. You could do a show I, just for him explaining what each yeah, one is. Yeah, well, he's got the whole gospel written there. Yeah. What's on this hand? Uh, Lord, I got help me, Lord. On help my... me, Lord. There you go. So. There you go. So when, you, well, when you're in trouble, you just hold up your fist <laughs> yeah. and you're there with Jesus. Hey, thanks for being on the oh, show. And if you want to learn more about the Re Revolution Church, go to our website, uh, redletterchristians.org. First on the list is our uh, television show, and you can learn about Jay and about Revolution Church and all those good things that we're talking about. We'll be right back. <music> Kathy, as we talk to Jay, I hope you got the impression, as I know is the truth, that he's not somebody who questions the doctrines of the Apostle Paul. He's one of the few guys who came on the show with his Bible in his hand. I know. <laughs> yeah. He does not question the doctrines of the Apostle mm -hmm. Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, in that sense, as biblical as they come. The problem is he wants to be completely biblical. Mm -hmm. And that's where most people are not willing to go. I think people go. are confused. Though. You know, when they hear Red Letter Christianity, they're, not, they're thinking that is it. Yeah, it's not. You've got to have solid doctrine to, you know, his emphasis on grace. Where did he get that? You heard him say, 
reading Ephesians, reading Galatians, eventually reading Romans. I get the doctrines. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. God loves us anywhere, right. any place, anytime. He'll never stop loving us. And we should, in His name, love one another. That's what He tells us to do. He then goes to the red letters and starts talking about this lifestyle of Jesus, reaching out to the people in the margins, the people that the church rejects, that the religious institutions rejects. I mean, uh, and having a great time with them, partying with them. I know there are going to be people who watch this show who are going to say, well, if he was a man of God, he wouldn't be hanging out at bars preaching the God. You know, they said of Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, if he was a man of God, he wouldn't be hanging out with those prostitutes, sure. with those sinners, with those whores, with those pimps. He wouldn't be hanging out with them. But I, what a sad picture, Tony, you know, when he said, watching the kids outside of the church. Yeah. You know what I loved? One time I was visiting Brooklyn Tabernacle. A guy came in just stumbling drunk. And I was thinking of there's some churches, many churches in America, if that happened, you'd have the ushers yeah. usher, usher him out. And they, they just placed him in a seat. Yeah. And I'm glad you said some churches, yeah. because uh, one of my friends who's a preacher uh, decided that he would preach on the, on the uh, Good Samaritan. So he had a friend of his dress up like a derelict, like a bum, and, and, and act like he was drunk, lying on, and poured alcohol on him so he smelled the high heaven, lying on the steps of the church on Sunday morning so that the people would walk by him into the church, and he would say, are you not like the priest and the, and the Levite who walked by the man who had been left on the... You're no better than they are. Right. <laughs> I couldn't preach a sermon because everybody was coming into the church saying, you can't stay out here. It's cold. Come on inside with us. Sit with us. We'll take you out to dinner afterwards. You know? And he said it ruined my whole sermon because <laughs> my, my, my members were too Christ-like. <laughs> you know? you know? Oh, I love you know? that. We, we're so quick to make judgments, aren't we? Right. Yeah, and uh, that's what I think Revolution Church is about. Whether you're pious, whether you're reprobate in the eyes of the church, you're welcomed here. That's what Christianity was revolutionary. It's going to be interesting to see this generation, 20 years from now, of believers doing it this way, yeah. just living it out so radically. This program is going to upset a lot of people. But I got to tell you, people, this is the church of the future. It's not the old church that we knew. A new church is breaking loose in the world. And Jay Baker is just one evidence of that new church. So uh, think about this. Pray about this. Read scripture. Do what the red letters tell you and believe what the black letters teach you. That's the message of this show. So come back and listen to us every time you get a chance. Blessings on you and keep the faith.